Uh, you know, with a you know a railroad river, and had all the business of working on the railroad, and uh, there was section crews worked out of McKinnon and Stewart, and uh, uh, people worked on the river boats, you know, and uh, they stopped there, and of course there was muslin, they'd catch mussel shells, you know, and sell them for buttons, and uh, then of course during the depression the railroad was smart enough to rebuild a bridge across there. That had nothing to do with the flood. That was before they even found about the flood. And uh, so, of course, there was farming and fishing. There was uh, a couple of people that made a living catching fish and selling them. And uh, of course, you know, it wasn't a small town, so people would come there. And then uh, there was uh, a lot of people would come from Clarksville and stay at the hotel and hunt quail because in those river bottoms, you know, they didn't couldn't get all the corn because when you lay the corn by in real rich ground like that and where it's flooded, I guess there must have been a lot of weed seed come in. Anyway, after the corn was laid by, you couldn't hardly get in there, you know, for the growth of the corn and everything. So they get it, they hand picked it, they didn't have machinery to pick the corn like they do now. So they have a wagoning team and they'd, they'd go down one road, you know, the wagon would knock one road down and the guys on either side would pick it and then some, uh, usually somebody short or young would pick what they call a down road because the wagon would knock that road down and you had to bend over, to, you know, or the other. Anyway, the down road, they left a lot of corn. And uh, we used to go and after the farmers left because it flooded, nobody lived down there. Uh, Clarence Day and his family owned a lot and they come from, they lived almost in McKinnon <coughs> and they farmed and when they got through gathering corn in the winter, you didn't see them until plowing time next spring, you know. So you could go in there behind them and you could find lots of corn that was left, you know, accidentally, the down row and even the size and sometimes they threw it up in the wagon they'd miss, so they didn't bother to pick it up. I guess, because you could find it. And we fed two cows and three pigs, and we bought about half the corn for them. The rest of it we picked up, called it gleaning, and because there's lots of acreage, you know, that to left there. And it only get flooded, you know, before spring and rot, so nobody cared if you picked it up. And uh, so this, that was something to keep you out of trouble in the late fall. <laughs> and, uh, do that and and of course uh, uh, Smiley Sand and Gravel come there to build that new bridge and they way years before the bridge <coughs> and they pumped they had a big pump and they pumped uh, they go where a creek come out like uh, Cane Creek and White Oak Creek well out in the river where the creeks come out there was gravel beds under the water anywhere from 8 to 20 feet deep, you know, big gravel beds. I guess it was washed in there from the creek. Anyway, they knew it, so Smiley Grit and Pebble or Smiley Sand and Gravel, they had these pump boats and they dropped this great big thing down in there and they'd pump up water, gravel and all, and then they'd pump it up to, and they'd go down screens and they're different size screens so the, the rocks that weren't good would fall out through the, you know, and they'd, they'd grow over the screens and then back into the river. And then the, the sand would go through one layer and gravel the other. So they, they had a the different size sand and gravel and they sold it to the railroad to build a piers. And not only that, they, I don't know where they went, but they'd load uh, coal cars with gravel. And it left Danville, I don't know where it went, because, you know, I wasn't interested in where it was going <laughs> at the time. And uh, so they hired a lot of people to work. You know, smiley sand and gravel. In fact, my brother that threw the uh, jack in the river, uh, he worked later, he worked there for him uh, uh, running the steam boiler. That's how he learned to run a boiler. And uh, they had a steam boiler to run the, to pump the gravel out of the bottom of the river. And there's all kinds of work like that, you know. Why you lived in Danville, do you remember any of the big floods? Pardon? When you lived in Danville, do you remember any of the big floods? Oh yeah, ever, ever spring. Uh, 
well, in uh, 27 and 37 was the worst ones. And then every spring and they'd come up, uh, uh, about every 10 years we'd get a, a super flood. It would cover the railroad track. I've got pictures of trains, and that railroad track was a half mile from the river, a quarter of a mile anyway, and about 20 feet higher than the fields around it. And the, the backwater would come up, and I've had boats tied. We lived uh, on the, I guess you call it the east side of the town, and I could tie a boat to my front porch. I never got in our house. But uh, it covered everything there, you know, and of course everybody knew it was coming. So the houses across the, from the railroad track, that you might have seen them, that they had those pictures. Well, those on the bottom side of the picture, they, they, had, they were on stilts. It didn't show that on the drawings they had there. They was on stilts and they had boats and stuff underneath and stuff under. They wasn't closed in under them. It just opened. But they'd have boats and keep stuff under there, and they were on stilts. So I, I've seen the water lapping that far from the floor, you know, in the floods, because they knew how high it would get at the highest. So they put the stilts up high. And, did and, uh, did the floods ever stop the trains? Oh yeah, they did. But not for long, you know, maybe for two or three days, because it go down enough that the train to go through. But sometimes they went through water. Uh, uh, close to two feet deep, you know, but they went real slow. But yeah, the, they never uh, washed the track out then. No, because you see, people don't understand that in that particular area. When you have a flood, it's backwater. The the river keeps getting up and it slowly comes up, you know. And if if it rises an inch an hour, that's pretty fast, you know. Of course, I guess there's exceptions. But anyway, it comes in slow, and it don't wash. Well, it can wash a little bit, but not much. But it comes in slow, and it goes out slow. And like I say, it left silt you know, on farmland that saved on fertilizer to some extent. And then, uh, of course, it filled ponds that, where there was low places. And sometimes when it went out, it'd leave fish in those ponds that was around, small ponds. But no, almost ever February you had a flood, but it was various, you know, how much. Yeah. Sometimes it would only, you could only see it down in the very lowest lands and up the creeks, you know, for a few feet. But almost ever, almost ever spring, like in February, and January and February, you could depend on it flooding. Even though it wouldn't be bad, it wouldn't bother nobody. But about every eight or ten years, you'd have a loose super flood and it covered everything for miles around. Not not quite as much as it's flooded now. <laughs> it never got that bad. Do you uh, do you remember any doctors that were in Danville at that time? Well, uh, Doctor Job lived at uh, J O B E. Mm -hmm. He lived in uh, my hotel for a while, but that was when I was so little I hardly remember anything about him. And then, of course, Dr. Atkins uh, from uh, Erin uh, was my doctor, and Dr. Tom Linson was a doctor in McKinnon, and his wife was a school teacher. And uh, he didn't, I guess he almost had to teach school, I shouldn't say that, but anyway, I don't think he had enough business you know, to really be successful in a little town like McKinnon, Dr. Tom Linson. Did you and have besides, a... I think he's half retired because he's real old. Mm -hmm. He might have been had a good practice, you know, and they got older and semi-retired. Did they have a funeral home in Danville? Uh, not in Danville. The first funeral home I know of was in uh, Erin, uh, Herman Wiseman built a one right there on Main Street years ago. Uh, funeral. He, well, he started there in McKinnon and Danville a burial association. He, uh, I don't know if, if he had any kind of a place. Seemed like he had, oh, the church, I guess he'd use the church. For, somebody said he had a store in McKinnon. That somebody told me that he had a store in McKinnon. Yeah, uh, 
And he well, sold caskets out of the back. Yeah, well, he did. Yeah. I forgot about that. He had this store. Well, he had a small store on one side of the railroad. Then there's a big store that had been there for years and years on the other side of the railroad from where, where his little store is sitting there. Did you see that little store building Yeah. today? Yeah. Well, across the railroad track, the railroad not there now, there was a great big store. And uh, uh, he had that a while, but somebody had it before him. But I don't know. But he started this Burrell Association. And of course, I didn't pay much attention to it because I wouldn't care to be buried at the time. But anyway, I think you, you pay each time somebody died, I think you put in $2. And then uh, that took care of that person. And then uh, if, if you got more, then after so many, they'd have a little more. Sometimes they'd have one free, you know, if he collected enough off of two or three funerals, he'd get more money than it cost. So that, that he put that aside and ever so often, about every fifth person that died that would blow the association, got buried free. Um, of course, they had put in, of course, I free, but he, then he built that funeral home in Erin. And I don't know what ever become of that borough association. What about the, was there any cemetery down in Danville? Well, the Cane Creek Cemetery is in, it was up by uh, where Clarence Day, back at his house. It was about halfway between Danville and McKinnon, but it's on a ridge and it's still there. Uh, but, uh, most of my people are buried in Cumberland City. Are they? Yeah, in the funeral, in the, the uh, graveyard there. But Cane Creek Cemetery is a big ridge right behind where Clarence Day's farm was. And there's a lot of people from Danville. We went up there uh, two years ago. I brought my uh, daughter and son, son-in-law and daughter-in-law down. And we went up there and I showed them all the people's names that I knew, you know, that used to live here, the new houses, and the Bartels. And the, the Wests and all those people, and I saw some uh, those tombstones up there. People that I used to know years ago that I'd forgot about. You know. Do you remember the steam boat captain uh, that used to is buried in? I think his last name was Kemp or Kelp. Captain Kell. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he lived on a when he was alive. He lived on a hill up back of the hotel in Danville. Captain Kell, and uh, uh, I don't think uh, old man Henry West, he had something to do with the river boat, but I don't think he was ever a captain on one. Well, Kell is who I'm thinking of because we buried his wife back oh, in the 70s. Yeah. She was over 100 years old. My goodness. Yeah. But I remember that because we had to go into Cane Creek and dig it out by hand because they wouldn't let a backhoe go in there. Well, I think it was Ledessa Kell that had, was the lady, the daughter that had one brown eye and one blue eye. Huh. Did you ever know that? No. no, I didn't know that. Well, I didn't know it. I, you know, you're growing. And one of my sisters was a friend of my, one of my older sisters, Nancy, I think it was, or Ruth. And uh, they told me, and I hear I'd known her for since I was a kid, and I never knew that she had, yeah. <laughs> I never heard of a person having yeah, two yeah. different colored eyes. But anyway. So um, your your mother and father are buried in Cumberland City? They're buried in Cumberland City, really? in the cemetery there. I don't know what's the name of it, but they're buried up in the Cumberland City Cemetery. What happened to your father? Did he... Uh... He, he uh, they lived in there, <coughs> and uh, we are still burning coal in the grate. And uh, he seemed awful healthy. Anyway, he brought in uh, what we call a scuttle of coal. You know, it weighs about, what, 30 or 40 or 50 pounds. And uh, I don't know what that had anything to do with it, but it just happened that he brought that in just before dinner. And he says, well, I don't feel good. I think I'll lay down for a minute. Well, Mama said dinner will be ready in about less than an hour. Well, I'm going to lay down for a minute anyway. So he went in the bedroom 
and laid across the bed, you know, fully clothed. I guess he took his coat or something. Anyway, he laid down on the bed, and so Mama went ahead cooking dinner because it's still like. And she saw a call you when dinner was ready. She went in to call him, he'd cold stone dead. No no noise or no calling or or no nothing. Just laying across there. You know, he died. What year it, was this? Oh, uh, that was in 1952. Oh, okay. So they lived in Erin then? They lived in Erin, yeah. Because they, they'd sold their place in uh, Danville. Were they doing, were they working or was he running any kind of business? No, or? they just was retired. They okay. was in their. Uh, Eighties, uh -huh. you know, Dad was in his eighties. So you remember stories from your grandfather where he was in the Civil War? No, I just heard from my grandmother. Oh, uh, my grandfather was dead. She lived to be ninety-six, mm -hmm. and uh, I stayed with her for two weeks. And uh, when I was, I don't know, ten or twelve, something, I was just a kid, and she was living in this house alone. Well, her youngest son lived about oh quarter of a mile away and he used to come check on her. And she insisted on having her cow. Well, she couldn't take care of a cow, so her son took care of it. And uh, anyway, uh, I stayed with her there and she was telling me, she was 12 years old when the war ended. So she was telling me about the uh, carpet baggers and the Quantrells and so forth. And uh, my, uh, She's was, telling about the war didn't bother her as much. She missed some of it, you know. But the reconstruction after the war was what was she was telling me about. She remembered that. And uh, so, uh, was he a soldier in the war? Her daddy? Uh, yeah, uh, her husband. Yeah. Her husband? Yeah, my granddad. He oh, okay. was a soldier in the war. And uh, Do you know who my, he fought with or what? Pardon? Do you know what division he was in, or what? I mean, no, what? I don't know that. Oh. I, I, I know, like my own uh, grandparents. He like my my great great grandfather come over here on, from Ireland, and uh, it was William Gillahan, and uh, he had a maybe I told you this. He had another William Gillahan come at the same time. It was about fifteen years difference in their age, and we spent years and years searching to find out what relation they were. Well, they couldn't be brothers because they had both had the same first name, William Gillahan. They couldn't be father and son because there was only 15 age difference in their age difference. Hmm. So uh, we finally found some people in, uh, up in, uh, I don't know if I told you this before, found some people up in Arkansas that was related to the William Gillahan that we wasn't. Because we traced our William Gillahan, we knew for sure he was my great great grandfather. Yeah. And uh, but the other William Gillahan, we never did. But the the people in Arkansas was doing some family research, but not as extensive as we did. Well, they knew the other William Gillahan. They heard about our William Gillahan, but they didn't know. They too didn't know what relations the two William Gillahans had to each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, might have been cousins or something. I don't know. But uh, we never did that, run that down. But then my great grandfather, he come over, and then his son was Clement Gillahan, and he, uh, my grandfather, fought in the Revolutionary War, in the, and he was uh, fought in the Battle of Kings Mountain. Hmm. And uh, my wife and I went up to the museum in Kings Mountain, and it showed we knew we knew by research that he worked under General Huber, uh, was a German that was in this country and he fought on the side of the of the uh, Americans, you know, or whatever. Uh, current, and uh, uh, then um, we knew who the captain was that my great grandfather was under Captain Jarvis. It was in his unit. Well, it, this in the museum there, they showed a picture of where each unit went up. So I followed the same route up, I think. <laughs> the mount, uh, the Tingis Mountain that my great grandfather did because it didn't say his name or nothing, you know, because he was a private, mm -hmm. and privates don't get much published. Yeah. But anyway, Captain Jarvis went up this. It showed the route that he went up, so I followed Captain Jarvis's route up the mountain because from the picture that they had in the museum, I think I was on it, 
and hopefully that he he was went up with Jarvis. If it did, I went up the same mountain that my great grandpa, and uh, and then uh, uh, Clement Gallahan, he fought in the Civil War, and he fought on the side of the South, and then uh, James Gallahan, he fought in uh, World War One. I, I think it was yeah. Well, where were you at when World War Two broke out? I was in Michigan, and uh, how'd you hear about it? The, pardon? How'd you hear about the war starting? Well, my uh, girlfriend and I, and her girlfriend, decided to go that Sunday morning. We decided to go horseback riding, or they did, and then, of course I had a thirty-nine Plymouth, and I took them to this uh, uh, horse the stable where they could ride horseback. And on the way there, on, we had the radio on because we'd go early in the morning. And they come on radio all excited that Japan had just bombed Pearl Harbor and all that. And, it's, and they didn't have much news, you know. They said they're bombing Pearl Harbor and one thing or another. And uh, they didn't have many details, but they kept saying, you know, about it. And the girls kept chattering away about whatever the women talk about, you know. And I tried to shut them up. I said, we're in war. Oh, no. You know, they had, uh, what was it, some guy had put on the War of the Worlds on yeah. radio and scared the hell out of everybody? Yeah. Well, they thought it was another joke. Huh. Well, I knew damn well it wasn't. I don't know why I knew it wasn't, because I wasn't any sharper than anybody else. But it just seemed like I could tell, you know, uh, because my dad had said that we're going to have war with Japan because you can't order the Japanese out of China and give them 60 days to get out of China because if they wanted to get out of China they couldn't get out in 60 days. They got too many people there. Mm -hmm. At least that's what my dad tried to say. But that's beside the point. I still, some for some reason, I was convinced that it was war. It wasn't one of those jokes. Well anyway, we stopped at the clubhouse for the uh, riding stable and they went in, you know, and I stayed in the car. Come on in. It's just a, a show. You know. I said, no, it's war, damn it, and I'll be going. Anyway, they go in. So finally, you know, they didn't have no other news to tell you that they're bombing Pearl Harbor, and then they'd say something. And so I went in the clubhouse, and here all, all the gang that was in there for riding and so forth was huddled around this radio, and they knew it was war. And so my what a girlfriend and her friend shut up and was listening to it. Well, anyway, after they went, we went horseback riding, all of us. And then, so I went home early. I usually would stay, a, you know, a lot. But I wanted to find out what everybody thought about it. So I figured the best way to find it is stop in bars because <laughs> they'd be talking. So I stopped in a bar or two just for a few minutes, you know, and listened. Of course, we had Japan wiped off the face of the earth, even some fair islands. The war will last at least three months, maybe at the most. We'll wipe, they just committed suicide. Boy, we were stupid. We didn't know how much damage, it, they hadn't told us at that point how much they'd sunk half our damn Navy. Well, I found that out later. So, so what'd you do? Did you enlist? I tried to and they wouldn't, they said no. Uh, I was already, uh, had a deferment, you know. I'd already signed up, but I had a deferment from, from the draft because I was working at Chrysler building tanks, or they were building, I wasn't, but they, uh, they were building tanks for the Army. Even before the war started? Yeah, before the war. So I got a one-year deferment because the company asked, because they was losing people, you know, yeah. uh, being drafted before the war. Well, anyway, soon... Uh, the war was declared on Sunday, the, December the 7th, I mean the Jap... Well, they called me Wednesday the 10th. <laughs> Took them three days. <laughs> and I guess the reason they got me so soon, I don't know if it was I was due anyway, or the fact that I had a deferment. Because I was supposed to go in a year before, a year and a day. You know, we were supposed to go in for a year and a day. But anyway, they called me up, so I... You know, told everybody goodbye, had a party, kissed my wife, uh, girlfriend goodbye, and went down to go in the Army. You ain't going in the Army. You, well, you sent down now, you know, I mean today. You're not in the Army. So they, you know, gave me a physical and wrote everything down and said, come back here January the 18th. And this was December the 10th. 
So they said, you, you'll go in. So my birthday was on the uh, 17th. So I had a big party that night. and This time it was real. So they, I went downtown Detroit to the draft, draft board and uh, they sent me to uh, Fort uh, Custer in uh, Fort Custer, Michigan to be inducted and they inducted me and sent me to the cavalry of Fort Riley, Kansas, me and nine others. And I noticed something. They only sent nine to the cavalry out of hundreds of guys there at Fort Custer, Battle Creek, Michigan. And uh, I noticed that at that time I was 5'11". I'm, I'm only 5'9 now. I shrunk two inches. But anyway, I was skinny. And I noticed the other eight guys that was going to Fort Riley were all tall and slender like me, you know. Weighed, you know, like I think I weighed about 145 or 50. And they looked like anywhere from, you know, 140 to 160 and tall. And so when I got to Fort Riley, they were going to put me on a horse. And I run into an old uh, guy. I thought he was old. He was in his mid thirties. <laughs> anyway, he had been in the Marines, and uh, he'd been in the Horse Marines, you know. And uh, so he told me what you had to do if you was on a horse. I was anxious, you know. I'd go horse cavalry. I ride the nice horse, but, you know, because they have the best horses in the world. The cavalry did, and. Uh, Boy, when he got through telling me what the detail to, you know, being a private. Now, if you're an officer, that's different. But yeah. Private and a horse, you got to clean the horse, you got to clean his hoofs, you got to. And when you get through, and if you're out on the field and the horse gets sweaty and it's time for, you have to clean him with your blanket and then you sleep on that blanket. And uh, you have to clean, and then when you get yours, the bridle and your saddle all polished and everything, then you have to do that for one of their officers, you know. You have to clean his horse and his bridle and saddle. And of course, there's more enlisted than our officers, so you, ever, you wouldn't have to clean it every time. But anyway, so he finally talked me into, uh, when they went up to classification, I told him I was afraid of horses, I didn't want to ride the horses. So I was lucky, they put me in mechanized cavalry. So I got to be in a scout car instead of a oh. horse. And uh, I still was kind of wished I would could have got on the beautiful horses. But when he got through saying all he had to do, <laughs> and b being on the scout car wasn't much better. So I, I got my cavalry training in a scout car, in a mechanized cavalry. From there, where did you go? I went to, I signed up for aviation cadet. You know, you could do that, you know, when you're in the Army. They needed cadets for pilots, and I passed all the tests and made cadets. So they sent me to uh, Maxwellville, Alabama, and for orientation, uh, and then they sent me to uh, primary training in uh, America's Georgia. Souther Field was the name of it, and that's where Lindbergh first flew from. I didn't know that till I got there. They had things all over the wall about Lindbergh. I guess it was true they wouldn't. Hmm. you know, put it up. But anyway, they said he come there and bought a plane, took two lessons and flew to Detroit. I don't hmm. know if that was true or not, but anyway, that was the story they told. But anyway, I went there and I took pre-flight and I passed everything, you know, studying and, and took weather and uh, meteorology and all that stuff. And then the, uh, they sent me to fly and uh, uh, so I got to uh, Southern Field, and they took us out and they said, now this is an airplane, and they started explaining it, you know, and some of the guys laughed, they said, you know, and the sergeant said, shut up, you better listen, because your life depends on what you learn here. And they laughed because he said, this is an airplane, like you didn't know. Well, of course we hadn't, I, as far as I was concerned, I'd never been up in a plane, I'd seen them. I knew it was an airplane, as a steerman, by wing and trainer plane, and uh, so I, I got that and I passed fine. R.L. Day was my instructor. He was a civilian hired by the Army because they didn't have enough instructors, I guess. But he was a barnstormer before the war, and uh, he was a top pilot. And uh, uh, anyway, 
I went through him and he had great hopes for me because he said I was just a natural for flower. And then when and I graduated from that and they sent me to Greenville, Mississippi to uh, basic flight. And I got down there and they were about way behind. And I sat there for, oh, three weeks taking link trainer. You know, that's, you know what a link trainer is? You learn to fly blind in that thing, but it's just on the ground, you know. It has all the instruments, and uh, you you can even crash one. Of course, you don't actually crash, but, you know, teaching to fly blind at night. But anyway, I had 24 hours in that thing, and all it required is eight, but they didn't know what to do with it. They were sitting there, and, they, and if there was a free day, it rained every day, and if it was a free day, the upperclassmen, I, of course, when you go in, you're under class. And then you, when you get so far, you, they move out and you get to be upper class. Well, our, the, our underclass was still there. You know, they hadn't moved up to upper class. Mm -hmm. So here we was doubled up. And uh, so we didn't get to fly very much. And finally I got this instructor whose wife wouldn't live in the town that, that near there. And so he wanted to get off early. And I was the last flight, so I run into the uh, Sergeant Beasley, who I, I'd known in Big Sandy, the only guy I met in the Army the whole four years that I ever knew before. Mm. And he told me, I better, he asked me who my uh, instructor was. He'd been there as a sergeant on the line for a long time. And I told him, and he says, uh, when do you fly with him? I said, well, whenever it is. I mean, what time of the day are you the, I said, we're late. Are you the last flyer? And I said, yeah. He said, you better change instructors. Well, you know, you don't change instructors. So I went, and sure enough, six hours he got rid of me. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't do nothing right with him. He grumped at me from the time. He fussed at me about it. And we'll go out on the line, you know, and you, when you pull out there and you, to, to get on the flight line to go, you have you can't see you know out of the plane you know when it's on the ground you can't see over the yeah. to see if anybody's coming so you go out like that and then you stop and you watch and see if anything's coming I stopped you know to go on the to get on the runway and they said what the hell are you waiting for well I knew I was in trouble no you know I just got there I didn't even have time to fill out my phone one and I said well I'm looking to see if anybody's coming in there's nothing coming let's go. You know, that's kind of, and that went on, and finally, uh, and every time he'd, uh, he'd get me up, you know, and and uh, do a power on spin. Well, I'd start the spin, I'd get about two-thirds of the way around, and he'd kick it out. He was stronger than me, and he'd kick the damn thing out, and I asked him why, and he said, because you can't wind up this BT-13A, is a volatile vibrator, he says, it'll wind up so tight you can't jump out of it. Well, there had been cadets and instructors killed there. Two instructors and five cadets had been killed there over the last few years. I mean, some of them even before the war. But anyway, uh, I don't know. He was a major, and I think he felt uh, something was wrong, that he was a major and having to train stupid cadets, I guess. I don't know. But anyway, he was rough, and uh, so he, he told me that. So then... Uh, when I started the last time I go up, uh, I knew he was going to wash me out. Hell, you can tell. And uh, they're gruff and not give me a chance. So we goes out, you know, and I clear myself. He says, uh, well, I did a slow roll. And uh, I asked him, uh, was my, you know, I was trying to find out what the hell was wrong. I said, how was my slow roll? He waited a while and said, all right, that's all I got. And he said, well, do me a power on spin. Well, in the meantime, I had adjusted the rudder so that when I kicked the rudder forward, my leg would be straight before, you know. And then he was strong enough to kick it out. And I got a double hut and I, so when he said, do me a power on a spin, I kicked those damn thing and I drew the rudder back and I put that and I done a 360 degree spin in spite of his kicking. Mm -hmm. And I come out right on the button, which was lucky because I couldn't have, you know, just normally, you, you're lucky to come out on 360 in a spin, but it just luck was with me that for a split second. 
and I come right out on the button on it. So they done uh, something else, I don't know, lazy eight or something. He says, take me back to the airport. And the way he said it, I didn't like it. So I uh, took him back to the airport. So he jumped out of the plane, took off, and of course I'm trotting behind him with that chute hitting me in the butt. We had to wear a parachute then. And I says, uh, well, how was my spin? He didn't answer me for about 10 or 15 steps. We was heading toward the ready room. You know. And finally he said, it was all right. But I don't think he knew what you're doing. That's the very attitude of you. I don't think he knew. And I come out right on the button, which was lucky. I don't think he knew what you're doing. Well, I knew I was washed out till the next day. He didn't wait, you know. And I didn't have a chance to ask for a check ride, which is illegal. You can't, you're not supposed to wash you out. You're supposed to have a check ride. Your instructor is, well, I went before the board the next morning at 8 o'clock. You know, this was 5 o'clock in the evening. And well, they just, what they told me, the major that, you know, and they had a civilian girl in charge writing it all down. And what they told me about, I shouldn't have ever been near an airport. Boy, I'd done everything wrong. His report, you know, and uh, so they said, and that's all, and I saluted. Well, uh, a friend of mine, a Greek friend of mine, Arthur Bartzokas, he washed out the next day. Well, the board that meets every two weeks when you're washed out, you go, you, they don't throw you out that morning. You, the board meets every two weeks, and you go before a board. Well, when he went before the board, he said, I was washed out illegal. He said, I was washed up by my instructor, and I'm supposed to get a check ride. I didn't get a check ride. And what you're supposed to get when somebody puts you up, they recommend you, your instructor, for elimination. All right? They pick a pilot that don't know anything about you, supposedly, except how many hours you've had dual, how many hours you've had solo, and that's all. Not your good, bad, or indifferent. And that check rider takes you up, and he checks you on the amount of hours you've had. Well, I had six. You're supposed to have eight before you even think about, you know, soloing or landing. Well, anyway, uh, they gave me this right, and that's all I salute. And he saluted, and it's in. The only place I could go then was the President of the United States, and that you can't do. You know, it'd be impossible. Mm -hmm. So I, first thing I did is I went straight when I was washed out and said, I want to transfer back to the cavalry. Well, they sent me to two radio schools before they got around to send me. And back and they sent me to Fort Brown, Texas, and I was supposed to go to Officer's OCS. I applied for Officer OCS in the Cavalry Center. I didn't make it in the Air Corps. So I got down there and I applied. So they said, well, the next school is open in six weeks. Well, what happened? We go on maneuvers with the Cavalry all along the Mexican border. And I was a radio operator, and I couldn't read the fist of the, uh, the Mexicans. Uh, I could read the, the code, you know, because they said the same code as I learned, International Morris Code. But their their fist, we call it, their way of sending you know, it went up and down. And I couldn't copy them very good, but because I, I copied. But anyway, so I, I enjoyed being a cavalry, and then uh, I stayed in that and uh, on maneuvers, and they called me to go to OCS, and the officer left behind it to camp at Fort Brown. Told him I got a telegram to report to go to Cavalry OCS. And he says, uh, Gillahan is not available. He's mm -hmm. on maneuver. So I was way the hell, 500 miles away. So I missed that, and of course they only have a, you know, so often. So I had bad luck. So then my sister was a major in the Army. She was a nurse. She was uh, over there when they bombed. She got over there a week before they bombed Pearl Harbor. And she got caught in uh, Corregidor and Bataan and all that. And she got out on a submarine spearfish. And uh, she only weighed about 90 pounds when she got out of there, down near starved to death, because they didn't have no food. And she worked 12, 14 hours a day, you know. And uh, anyway, uh, uh, her friend was G1. and. Uh, some colonel she's going with, she wasn't married. And uh, she got me transferred to Second Army Headquarters. She denied it, but no damn well she did. Why would they transfer me from the cavalry to Second Army Headquarters? 
she must have had some influence with somebody. G General Shu, I guess, and uh, Colonel Baker was her boyfriend, and they finally married. Well, anyway, she was saving me from having to go overseas. Okay, I was there three weeks, and somebody come around and said, Are you in uh, Second Army or Eighth Army? And I said, What do you mean, Second Army? This is sec I'm in the Second Army headquarters. And the sergeant said, Hey, smart ass. And the, the uh, major that was asking me the question, he said, He doesn't know. You know, he told the sergeant not to, you know, the sergeant was on me for saying, hell, there's no such thing as 8th Army. This is 2nd Army headquarters, you know. And, and here it was. It was it's the first military secret I ever heard because there was no 8th Army. It's, uh, well, they was forming it then, mm -hmm. but it's actually completed in Hollandia, New Guinea. And and uh, so about a week later, so finally it settled down. They said, yeah, you're in the 8th Army. You, you go into New Guinea, and this is, you know, you're not supposed to tell this. Well, about a week later, I was uh, going into Memphis on the streetcar, and there's a kid sitting across the street, and he kept eyeing me, and looking at me. And finally, he spoke up. He says, "Hey," he says, "Are you going? Are you in Second Army or Eighth Army?" I said, what the hell? <laughs> you know, a kid on. He says, "My dad's in the Eighth Army, and he's going to New Guinea." I thought, "Uh oh, we'll never make it." If he knows, he's told on the streetcar, the Japs know. <laughs> uh, anyway, but that's why military so-called, well, it wasn't actually a secret. It was, a, what's it called, a Top confidential. Yeah. But my God, I guess the Japs knew more than we did about where we were and what we were doing. But anyway, so, I, so they put me on the ship in 21 days. It took me to uh, Finch Haven, New Guinea, and then to... Uh, lay, I forget what come first in uh, Thailandia, and it's 21 days, and I was wasn't very heavy then. I weighed about 152, and I lost 21 pounds on that ship. Boy, they fed us twice a day. It took two hours to line up. Oh, that was miserable. And they packed us in there like sardines. It's on the General Pope, and it was high. It was designed to hold uh, 6,000 men. They put 10,000 on us. 121 colonels, or high-ranking officers, because it was an army headquarters, and they had half the ship, and those 10,000 had the other half. God, oh boy, that was a miserable trip. I never, I, I couldn't carry my duffel bag off, you know, the boat. I had to drag it off. I was so weak, and so I couldn't have fought a Jap if he had been sick. Uh, and then we went up to land in, in. Uh, General Byers come, and General Eichelberger, that was he was commander of the Eighth Army, and uh, General Byers was chief of staff, and I was assigned chief of staff section. So I went up there and reported to General Byers, and he said, "Well, there's a rumor that all you staff men are going to be transferred out." He said, "That's not true." He said, "You're going to stay right here if you will." He says, I've heard that the 2nd Army was pretty well organized. And he says, I'm proud to take over the 2nd Army headquarters. Mm -hmm. So he didn't transfer, so I got to stay in there. So what did you do while you was on New Guinea? I was, uh, my job was uh, status to take care of three books called the Status to Units. And I took care of General Eichelberger's book, and I took care of uh, uh, General Byers' status units. And uh, Colonel Thayer uh, from Ann Arbor, Michigan. He he was the deputy chief of staff. I took care of those three. They're all the same. Everything is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And all I did was keep them up to date. That showed where every unit under the Second Army, I mean Eighth Army, uh, where they were, where they'd been, and where they were going. And I got uh, like telegrams and uh, and paperwork, and I had the fill that in and if it's mark out something to show where each unit was. So I knew where everybody was and what they were doing. Yeah. I knew quite a bit. And of course, I wasn't allowed any secrets, but I could see a lot of confidential stuff. But anyway, I kept those status of units up and uh, for the uh, two generals and the colonel. And I worked directly under the 
the Secretary of the General Staff, Colonel Greve. He was my direct boss. And then the sergeant, my boss, was Sergeant Bad Shell. And uh, he was a master sergeant, a first a top sergeant. But he didn't have much to do. He just took care of the, the general. When did you get out of the Army? Pardon? When did you get out of the Army? Well, uh, well I went, when the war was over, I went to. Uh, the Eighth Army was the Army of Jap uh, Army of Occupation, so I went to Japan and I stayed there for several months, and uh, I got discharged on points. You know, you have so many points, so I got discharged in. Lord help, it was in what, forty-five or something. Anyway, How did the Japanese treat you? Oh, fine, no problem at all. They. Uh, the uh, Japanese girl that was in my office, uh, she brought the first green apple I saw it red. It was uh, Granny Smith, they call them here in this country. Well, I've never seen green apples that were ripe, you know. I've seen green apples. Yeah. But, and she come there with tea, you know, uh, and uh, her name was Hatsui. And I, she'd worked in that NYK building, and in that, they, we got our headquarters, it was MacArthur's headquarters at first. Let me stop it. Uh, it, it was still yeah. on? Yeah, now you are. But where were we? Oh yeah, I took care of it. Said, anyway, uh, when uh, she come up with tea, you know, every nine o'clock in the morning, and sat on a little table there beside me, and she started peeling the apple. And I went, why in the hell? She, well, all right, so she peeled an apple that night. And then she cut off a piece and fed me like a damn baby. <laughs> I was so embarrassed, I didn't know what to do. So uh, Colonel Reeve, he, he was Secretary of the General Staff, he knew all that stuff in advance. He said, you're supposed to eat the apple, you're supposed to take it from her. I said, well, she said he said, that we're supposed to go by the Japanese customs, you know, it's their custom. You know, so. She put the knife out with a piece of apple on the end of it, and I took it. <laughs> I felt so embarrassed, but finally I talked her out of it. She couldn't speak English, but she could understand it, or else didn't want to speak it. But anyway, so finally she cut it up, you know, and put it on a tray, and let me take a fork and eat my apple and drink my tea, mm -hmm. because I was embarrassed sitting there like a child eating somebody feeding me an apple. It was some customer theirs, I guess. But anyway, so I got along with her. How'd you come back to? How'd you get back to the states? Well, they we we had points, you know, yeah. and Colonel, uh, I mean General Byers, come out and uh, he said, "I'll make you." I was just a sergeant, you know. He says, "I'll make you a tech sergeant next week," and he says, "I want you in charge of uh, the Japanese crew and the generals." quarters, not in the office, but in his personal quarters where he lived. I says, I can't speak Japanese. He says, shit, they speak, I'm sorry, I says, they speak German, French, and English better than you. <laughs> says, so, you, so, but what they want you for is you pass the orders from General Eichelberger to his Japanese crew, you know, that does the housework. Of course, he's got his staff, I don't give them no orders, they're just the Japanese house crew out of sport, and he says, I'll make you master sergeant within three months. And he, but I had to sign up for, I think, a minimum of two years. And I had no way, it's back then you didn't call the United States from Japan. Yeah. You sent a letter, you yeah. know, or maybe airmail. And General Byers told me, he says, if you'll stay, he says, I don't know how the Japanese are going to work, but if there's any wives or allowed over here, yours will be the first. You know, I told him, you know, I was just married. and uh, But I had no way of notifying my wife would she come, you know. So I said, no, I guess I'll go home. So well, so I come home, and when I got home, my wife said, well, I'd been glad to come home. <laughs> but it was too late. So you married before you went into the Army? Yeah, I married while I was in. Okay. Uh, I, was, uh, I was in radio school in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, radio operators, I think, or was it mechanics? I took radio mechanics first, then took operators. Sorry. And the wife, uh, girlfriend, come out to see me, and uh, I had a friend of mine. His name was Dick Bennett. 
Marilyn, Mar Marion Disbennett. And he stood up for me and I got a license and went in and when she got off the train, I called a cab. We got in the cab and I said, you want to get married? She says, when? I said, tonight. She said, tonight. I said, y'all got the license. I got a preacher already in the courthouse. And so we went to the basement. Of course, the courthouse was closed. And we went in the basement and me and her and this Bennett. And then we went from there to a hotel and had dinner together. Then this Bennett went back to camp. And we got married that night. And what was her name? Uh, Doris Murray. Doris May Murray. Where was she from? She was from, uh, well, she lived in uh, uh, Farmington, which is, might say, a suburb of Detroit. What year did you marry? Uh, 43. In 1943, we got married. So you was gone from her for two years after you got married then? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she, uh, uh, she just stayed the weekend, you know, she was working in a uh, machine gun factory, making machine guns for airplanes, and Kelsey Hayes in Detroit, or out of Detroit, but in that area. And of course I was in the Army, so she spent the weekend with me, and we was married, and she went back home, and, and then when the war was over, we got together again. Where'd you live at then? Pardon? Where did you live at then? She lived in, in Farmington, and so I went to her house, and then I, I rented a, a place. I worked. I went back to Chrysler's for a short time, because you know they said they'd hold my job. So I went back, and of course there were a lot of people, and they hadn't been making many cars, but they put me back on, and so uh, I rented a place on the east side, you know, and then uh, I got a job at uh, with uh, Wayne County, and uh, as a painter, and. Uh, uh, I painted for a year and I got promoted to paint shop foreman. I had 25 men working for me as painters, you know, and I run the paint shop for, for the Wayne County General Hospital and infirmary and the nut house and every farm and all that out in February. But it was, uh, it was uh, one of the largest hospitals. That, well, we had uh, 3,300 patients and 2,200 employees. It was like a city. And I had 25 full-time painters working for me. So I worked there till I retired. I retired uh, May the 5th, 1977. And I've been retired ever since. How many children did you all have? I, got, I had four. My oldest son died at 56. He got cancer. And what was his that, name? And, uh, it was a bad one. It don't last long. What was his name? Pardon? What was his name? Uh, Michael Thomas. Mm -hmm. Michael Thomas Gillahan. What about your other children? Can you name them? Well, John, John David is my other son. He lives in Athens. And then my daughter, Kathy, she lives in uh, Hastings, Michigan. She's, uh, I'm living with her now. And uh, that's my son-in-law, uh, uh, Kathy's husband. It brought me down here from from Hastings, Michigan, which reminded nice of it. Then my youngest daughter, Gina Gale, it runs a she has a horse barn in uh, uh, Cookville, uh, Tennessee, and she trains riders. And she she has one every year. She has one that goes good enough to go to national. Sometimes she has two to go to national, and. Uh, she has a good reputation, and she's had, well, when she was in uh, Maryville, Tennessee, uh, she had people coming from Dayton, bringing their daughters up there because they wouldn't let them train, nobody else train them but her, because her daughters all were top riders. They made national and, and all that stuff. How many grandchildren do you have? Lord, I'll have to count. I got, uh, let's see. I got 14 grandchildren. How about great grandchildren? And, uh, nine great grandchildren. And how many great great grandchildren? None yet, but nine? I got a uh, great grandson that's 21, and I got granddaughter, great granddaughters that are in their late teens. So I may, if I live four or five more years, I'm for sure I'll have a great great. But I don't know. But I've got a. Would you believe I got a? driver's license, Tennessee driver's license, 
It expires on my 100th birthday. Oh, really? It yeah. expires the 20th of January, uh, 2017. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but now I've got a Michigan driver's license, and it expires in uh, uh, 16, 2016. What about your wife? She passed away in uh, uh, 2002. She's been gone 10 years. How long had y'all been married? Uh, 59 years and 7 months. Hmm. We didn't quite make it to 60 years. Was there anything, if we close, and is there anything you'd like to state about the change of the country in your 90, 95 years? You know? Well, in the 95 years, it's an absolutely, in my opinion, which is not the greatest, it's absolutely changed. and. I'm sorry to say, I think it's gone downhill a little. I hate to admit that, and I, I think, but we're not done. I don't feel that it's that done. It depends on who gets elected and what they do after they get elected and uh, what the Senate and, and House does. In other words, what our politicians do from now on, whether it's Democrat, Republican, or Vegetarian, whatever the, it has. They, they'll they have a lot of effect, and of course the people. And uh, I hate to say this, and I don't know what to do, but I think that we've got uh, we've got too many people. Now, there's a lot of argument against that, but I think 300 million is a lot. Of course, we've got room, you know, uh, if we can get things straightened out, but it just seems like when a country gets overpopulated, they run into trouble. It, History will tell you that. And another thing that worries me, not that I've got anything against Spanish or Spanish people, but the language Spanish, but I don't believe any country should have two languages. I don't care if it's Japanese, Chinese, uh, Greek, or what. I think people are better off having and speaking than using one language. Make the language legal, and if people want to speak their, their native language, not, i got nothing wrong with it. But make an official language, whether it's English, Spanish, French, or Dutch, uh, and then hold all people to that language for signs and, and communication. But let anybody that wants, no matter what nationality, let them speak their language to each other and whatever. Don't outlaw any language, but have one language for the country, because people are better off speaking the same language no matter what it is. Well, Mr. Gillingham, I, I fairly enjoyed this interview with you. Well, I, I appreciate you. I wish I had more time, because <laughs> we well, could sit here probably all night and talk. Yeah. 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 Oh, well, I, I enjoyed doing it. I, yeah. I'm honored to do it. I Next year, want, maybe I'll sit back down with you and talk a little bit more. Oh. Yeah. Your, your closing, what's your closing thoughts on Danville? I mean, what is your closing thoughts on Danville? Oh, well, I just, well, of course, I can't bring it back, mm. but uh, I'd like to come back to the, if they keep having these uh, reunions, I'd like to come back again if I live that long. And uh, Throw the little story in about the Pearl man that you met. Oh, yeah. Well, when I was uh, in the headquarters over in Tokyo, I was in the NYK building. Well, that was a, a building that was belonged to the civilian shipping companies. It wasn't Navy or... Army. It was civilian Japanese shippers, and it was a fancy place. But anyway, General Eichelberger took it over from General ba uh, General MacArthur because he wanted to go to Tokyo instead of Yokohama. And anyway, so we had it in our headquarters. Well, anyway, uh, Mikimoto, the big pearl, they raise pearls, you know, underwater. You've probably heard of the, the, that great pearl. Well, Mikimoto himself came there with a whole bunch of pearls to the headquarters, and he went in and sold to General Eichelberger and General Byers. Well, when he started to leave, General, or Colonel Grieve stopped him, and he says, you know, he'd like to buy pearls. Well, he, he, he didn't want to, he already seen the general he wanted to go. Well, he said, no, he says, I want to buy some pearls. And, he, and so I was certain, he said, the sergeant here, would you like some? I said, yes. So he says, Mickey Moe, 
no, he said, no, I'll go, I'll go. You know, he didn't want to sell to nobody but the general, because, you know, he had, and he, he would, of course, his agent would sell, but Mickey Moe told himself, just come to see General Ackerberger, you know, it's sort of a, yeah. what do you call it? Well, I'm not going to say the word, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, uh, Colonel Grieve, so finally he opened the case, and so I bought a, a, a perfect set of earrings and a, re a beautiful set of batch pearls, I mean the best, because he wasn't going to bring any second-hand, uh, not second -hand, any second-rate pearls to the general because he's trying to make points. So I bought those for, uh, for my wife, and now the, uh, since my wife passed away, I, give them, and I got the case with Mickey Moto's signature and everything, and uh, my uh, you know, my son-in-law here, his wife, my daughter, has got those pearls and she's got the box that come in and Mickey Moto's signature and mm -hmm. everything. So that was something to be able to buy direct from. Uh, I wasn't honored by him, I, but I mean, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, I didn't give it to him if he was a... So I you, took a, you plan uh, on coming back next year for the, the Danville reunion? I uh -huh. hope so. All right. But and I did. One, I made one bad mistake. A sergeant was in a. You know, you, that thing's off now, ain't it? No, it's still on. Oh, you're good. Well, anyway, they they put a sergeant in the old silk mill. Well, we had to. They had uh, equipment in there. We had to throw out and clean it ourselves. You know, for our quarters because it. You know, we went over there rather suddenly. You know, the war yeah. ended rather quickly. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, make a long story short. Uh, they, somebody, one of the surgeons went out and got a Japanese guy and brought him up there to help throw the machinery out so we could make it our room. Well, I go out and I pick out one, you know, it's my turn, so I picked out one and, and followed me, you know, and he made out like he couldn't speak. And he had on a business suit, and the only difference he had on his forked-toed tennis shoes and like wrap-around leggings, but otherwise business suit. So he followed, I motioned, he followed me up there and helped clean, and uh, so the the other one could speak English, the, the little one, and I asked him to interpret for this guy so I could talk to him. He said, I can't do it, I'll lose face. And he's of higher rank than me, you know, the Japanese who could speak English. Besides, he says, he understands everything you say. He knows English. He won't talk. And I can't interpret because I'm of lower grade. Mm -hmm. So, come, come to find, so I had the Samaria sword just, you know, enlisted one. It wasn't, you know, the kind that's really valuable, just like the enlisted men carried, but still a Samaritan. So when it got through, I gave him a pack of cigarettes, you know, for helping. So when he was helped out, just like him. And then, uh, so he he bowed, and I, so I handed him a sword. I says, how do you handle a two, because uh, uh, the guy told me he could understand me, a two-handed sword, because the murder dog is one-handed. So he says, I show you, perfect English. <laughs> he says, I show you, and he bowed. And I said, yeah, so I handed it to him. Well, he let give a squall and jumped up in the air and spin that thing around and, you know, and ever done all that thing. And you, he could have cut you in ten pieces before you knew it. And it whistled. He could spin it. And he jumped and screamed and, in the air. Well, anyway, he finally settled down and handed me back the sword. I handed him another pack cigarettes and and then the guy told me that he was a colonel in the army hmm. and he was Samari. Good Lord! And he could have killed us. Hmm. Anyway, so I told him, I said, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were an officer. We're not supposed to work ex-officers, you know, to do manual labor. And he says, I accept apology. I said, I don't mean it's an apology, it's an explanation. I just explaining, you know, I wasn't apologizing, but I told him that. So he bowed and, and left. And so the sergeant about almost tore me apart. Oh. Why would you hand that Japanese? And I said, well, I didn't know he was a Samaritan. I don't <laughs> give a damn if he was a buck private. Don't hand the Japanese a sword. <laughs> he could have killed us all. Uh, oh, Lord. I know uh, Cindy Sexton, uh, uh, the, she's a, uh, um, the anchor for a... Uh, news in Detroit and uh, uh, I told her that story. That they, what they had was uh, they had oral history for veterans 
and I went down there and made the history of the week or veteran of the week and so I got to talk to Cindy Sexton and I told her about that and she said well I'm glad you didn't get, get cut into 15 pieces. Oh Lord. Well, Mr. Gillian I, I do appreciate well, I, I, your time. I, I, I really feel do. honored that you well, did this. And I'm going to end it here so. Well I didn't mean to keep to uh, thank our sponsors, starting with Ace Hardware. They can be reached at 721-2500. They're located at Gray's Crossing there in Tennessee Ridge. That's on Highway 49. That's Ace Hardware. You can reach them at 721-2500. Ace Hardware, your friendly hardware place. Signature Healthcare, where quality of life is their mantra. Located in the Arctic community of Erin, Tennessee. They can be reached at 289-4141 for any information you may need. From a dream to reality, Traditions First Bank. They can be reached at 289-5500. It doesn't matter whether it's a, a banking account, a checking account, buying a car. Or a house, sir. Check them out. Houston, Houston County's, County's County only hometown bank. Children daily, whether it's a simple volleyball or a show or, or uh, anything. Uh, just keep it and electrical and heating and air conditioning for all your plumbing, electrical, heating and air conditioning needs. Call us at 931-289-4301. We install rude, reliable heating and air conditioning products. Call us at 931-289-4301. Call us today. Again, that's Arnold's Heating and Cooling, and their offices are at 2211 West Main Street here in Erin, Tennessee. who is about to face terror, a terror that is speeding towards her even now, from out of the darkness.
Ship, calling the mother ship. We've encountered a terrible race of giants. Send all the force you have. Repeat, invade, send all the force you have.
swell. I'm swell. You were saying, Your Highness? I was going to make a speech explaining how the citizens of Uranus are not always heartless destroyers. But why live in the past? You have 20 minutes at most before my death saucers arrive. Use your time wisely. That is all. Uh, guys, you gotta see this. You feel like loud music? What do you mean? Let's put the amp in the window. Unexpected thing ended unexpectedly, as such things often do. Thanks to the intervention of three young girls having a slumber party, the world is safe once again. But it will never be the same.